My name is Susie Pappas and today is April 30th, 2018. I'm interviewing Marcy Orley at the Max M. Fisher Federation Building in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This interview is being recorded as part of the Women in Leadership Oral History Project. Do you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes or for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? Yes, I do. The Women's Philanthropy Department of the Jewish Federation has had several names throughout its history, including Women's Division, Women's Department, Women's Campaign and Education Department, but for the purpose of this interview, um, I will refer to it as Women's Philanthropy, but you can feel comfortable to refer to it in whatever way that it comes into the conversation. Marcy, when and where were you born? Detroit, Michigan, July 20th, 1959. Um, and where did you go to school? So I went, I started school in Detroit Public Schools at Dow Elementary um, until third grade. Then we moved to Southfield and I went to Stevenson Elementary until sixth grade. Then I went to Roper for seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And after ninth grade, I went to Groves. We moved always, we moved three times and always in between Lazar and Telegraph. Okay. And okay. now I live very far west because I live between Telegraph and Franklin. And um, where did you go to college? I went to NYU undergrad and I went to Cardozo for law school. Okay. So um, how was religion observed in your house at, when you were a child? Um, we kept a kosher home and we were, I would say, fairly regular synagogue goers. Um, my dad loved Shart Tzedek. Um, we had Shabbat dinners. I would not say that we, we were not Shabbat observant, but we had Shabbat dinners. You know, I remember going to my grandparents' apartment um, on Myers for Shabbat. Um, I definitely, you know, one of my earliest memories is going, is being at Sherrod Sadek on Chicago Boulevard for Sukkot and going to the sukkah. I mean, I have like just a flash of memory of that. And I would say, I mean, I just told you that I changed schools a lot and went to, through, you know, three different school systems as well as private school. So Sherrod Sadek Hebrew School was really my consistent group of friends and my, you know, it was the thread of consistency for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember all of our observances as being a very happy thing and, and a joyous, joyous thing in my house. So, so um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, mom and dad and a little bit about how they viewed religion and how that filtered down to you and your family? Um, my mother, well, Judaism was very important to both my parents. My mom was Hungarian, so she grew up at B'nai Moshe. Um, my father was at Sharat Tzedek, and also his father did sometimes go to the Polish Shul, which I remember, those little shtiebels. But um, my dad grew up in a kosher home. My mom did not. So do you want to tell us? Keeping kosher was. Tell us who your father was okay. so we can just so, get that okay. right out there. We can get that right out there. So my dad, um, David Hermelin, um, he was a major leader in this community. Uh, he was international chairman of Israel Bonds. He was international chairman of World Ort. He had every leadership role. He was not president of Federation, but um, he was chairman of the campaign. And um, he also was very politically active became Bill Clinton's ambassador to Norway and um, unfortunately died very young at uh, 63 years old in 97. So, or 97. He was appointed ambassador in 97. He died in 2000. So, at 63. So, so you would say, obviously, that philanthropy was important to your family while you were growing up. Philanthropy was very important to my family. Um, we, I was very aware of all of the things that my dad was doing. Um, although it really was later 
you know, I was the oldest. So, you were you know, the oldest I, of I, I was the oldest of five children, and my younger siblings are ten years. You know, my younger youngest sibling is ten years younger than me. So, my parents' real involvement, where they, you know, were traveling for, you know, organizations and really going to meetings. When I was young, you know, they, my dad was focused on his business. It was, you know, I didn't have that same childhood experience of having parents who were, you know, as involved in the community. I was already, you know, gone in New York at college. My dad was chairman of bonds and he would come in every week for bond things and take me to dinner. But I didn't see it as much as a little kid, you know. Interesting. Um, okay. But... Jewish practice, Jewish observance, you know, that was all, you know, very much a part of. So did you, as um, a high school student or a college student, were you involved in any charitable activities then or religious, anything? No, I, re I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really much of a joiner, I would have to say. Um, I was pretty independent. I went to NYU. I didn't, I, I did not get involved at Hillel at NYU. Um, I was really involved at Hebrew, I mean, I was involved at Hebrew school. I was, you know, in Kadima, you know, youth group, um, in middle school, not mm -hmm. so much in high school. Okay. Um, and then again, not, not really in college. I would say that I sort of got reintroduced to being part, having, much more part of being part of the Jewish community in New York when I went to Cardozo because it was part of Yeshiva University. Um, my friends at the time were more observant. We started having Shabbat dinners in New York when I was in law school. So, you know, and then moving back here, which is a whole different part of the story. But um, I wasn't, I didn't really participate um, as a college student in you know, any Jewish organizations. Had you been to Israel by that time? Uh, only once. Um, we went in 1976 when there was no snow in Aspen because we were skiers and we went to Colorado every winter. Um, and in 1976, there was absolutely no snow. So at the very last minute, uh, a group of families, you know, went to Israel. And that was my first time that I'd gone. I didn't go as, you know, I didn't go on any, you know, teen trips or anything like that when I was a kid. And did I didn't go to day school, so. Did it impact you, though, when you went to Israel for the first time? Um, I was 16, and, you know, I'm going to be honest and say it was wonderful to be with my family, and, you know, I had a, had a great, I had a great time, but it wasn't, you know, this right. coming home thing. It, 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 okay. I was a, a very, I was a prodigal. I was a pretty rebellious teenager. So when did you first become involved with Federation, and how did that happen that you became involved in Federation? Um, when I graduated law school, I became engaged um, my third year of law school. I got a job in Detroit as a federal law clerk to Avern Cohn, and we moved home. Uh, I got married in September, and coming home and being part of this community, it never occurred to me really not to be involved. You know, obviously my parents were leaders in the community. My mother was a past president of, Federate, of women's philanthropy, women's department at the time. Um, I wasn't necessarily going out of my way to look to become involved, but when I was asked, you know, I was asked by Linda Klein to be a solicitor in business and professional when I had just come back. Mm -hmm. And I said yes. It, you know, it was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be part of the community. I really came back with not, not knowing very many people. It was almost like I had moved from, you know, not grown up here because my friends were gone. I would, had cycled through so many school systems that right, you know right. there wasn't anybody. I really didn't have my people, so. So, um, besides being a solicitor in uh, one of the 
campaign divisions. Did you do anything else within Federation? Um, I did. I, I was asked to do things and I pretty much said yes. Um, and I can't really, I, I can't specifically remember when I did which jobs. I can tell you some of my earlier memories of doing things. Really the first thing that I remember doing is being a solicitor in business and professional. And I can tell you that, you know, I was asked to be a vice chair and get workers. And so I got the person who I was studying for the bar with, who was Lynn Saxe, um, to do that with me. She had never done anything with Federation. Um, and Sue Curhan, who was my sister's friend, I asked them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also their, my asking them was their first introduction to doing anything. Uh, I have memories of going to um, coffee talk meetings at the old United Hebrew School building on 12 Mile. And uh, that I pr think had to have been about the time when the Federation building was still downtown and a lot of meetings right. were being held up here. Um, but I had my kids very quickly. I had four kids in six years and my oldest three I had in three years. So there were many years that I didn't really know how to speak English, <laughs> let alone, you know. And, and I can't really remember when I did what, but I, I did a lot of different things. So was your husband involved in Federation? Um, he became involved, he really became involved in Hillel when our kids were at Hillel. And he sort of became in, uh, involved in Federation a little bit through that. Um, you know, I think that he always took names and always solicited, and both of us did. And we sort of took that as a given, and it's interesting because we did that before we were involved, whereas I think now it's a much longer road to get somebody to do that. Um, but I think that Young Leadership Cabinet, which he joined a year before I did, and he joined Young Leadership Cabinet in 91, 90 or 91, um, that was a transformative experience for him. As so it was do you want to me. explain what that young what you're even talking about with young leadership cabinet? Yeah. Um, so Jewish Federations of North America, which is the umbrella organization of all the federations, um, there are about 150 federations that are part of that, um, has something called National Young Leadership Cabinet, which is uh, for at the time it's a, it's a minimum giving level. Uh, I think at the time it was $3,600. Um, and you go to a retreat every year for six years. Uh, it brings together, you know, young adults from all over the country um, who are involved, who are committed, and you meet people who are sort of like-minded from everywhere. And it, it really was something that was transformative to both of our leadership journeys, I would say. So what year did you start that? Um, I started in 92 and you know we did missions national I, I would say that our national involvement was something that was really important to both of us and has continued to be to this day. So were you more involved nationally before you became involved um, here locally? Did you take leadership positions in nine in the 90s when you were on campaign on the um, young leadership? I I really honestly, I can't remember. <laughs> and and I don't really have any materials to, you know, right. back me up either way. I, I had just had my Olivia, um, so that's my youngest, and she was born in 92. I had, as I said, four kids under the age of six. So I don't really remember what I was asked to do and what I did. I mean, I remember doing um, Spring Forum, which was the precursor to what we have now is Community Connections, which is a more intensive learning about the agencies. Um, I must have done something, is all I can think of, because I probably wouldn't have been asked. I'm sure that I had taken some leadership positions in campaign. Um, as, you know, I'd already been a vice chair. It's possible. 
but I really don't remember. Okay. I did after I went on Young Leadership, we took on Partnership um, 2000, which was in its infancy at the time. And tell us what that is. Um, that is, Partnership 2000 pairs regions in Israel, cities or regions, with regions um, in, in federations in the United States, in North America, in order to foster people-to-people -people relationships and develop stronger connections between the communities and Israel, both through people and through projects. And it's been an important thing in Detroit for me since its inception. We've had um, the upper central Galilee. Um, we have three communities there, um, the Jezreel Valley, uh, Migdal HaEmek, and Nazareth Elite. And that was uh, a project getting involved with something that Young Leadership Cabinet was doing locally, not nationally. Um, our local cohort for Cabinet got involved with partnership. I went on the partnership steering committee, um, and I, that was something that I was doing while I was you know, on Cabinet. And I also took leadership positions with Cabinet. Um, I was a regional chair. Um, well, let's go back to women's um, philanthropy, women's department. What, what was your journey within women's department, and how did you ultimately become president? Um, so my journey within women's department, and, and, I, and I have to go back a little bit to cabinet because a lot of the things that I learned there, you know, it wasn't that I didn't think of, my, I, I don't think people necessarily think of themselves as, oh, I'm a leader, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, but I got skill, I, I was given skills there that um, I was able to make use of um, in women's department. I remember being asked when I, after one of my cabinet years, to chair um, what was um, solicitor training, or and that was a really big deal for me because I was pretty much leading, you know, the training for the people that were coming up for, you know, Lion and for the other divisions. And speaking, it was something that I really had never done before. I was nervous about it, but it was something that meant a lot to me to be asked and um, was, I think, an important part of my becoming more of a leader in women's philanthropy. Obviously, I was, I was young at the time. Um, people didn't know me. I, I think, well, they, they know, knew who I was, but didn't necessarily know me outside of my being Doreen and David's daughter. So it was... So before we even go beyond there, talk a little bit of how that has impacted your your um, philanthropic career, being part of David and Dorian Hermelin. Um, if you don't mind. No, I, I don't mind, okay. and and um, I'm just thinking about it for a minute because I, I think it's it's probably impacted it, you know, so significantly. I, I'm sure that I was given many opportunities because people looked at what my parents had done and felt like, you know, I could probably do that. You know, the apple may not have fallen so far. You know, I don't know. I, I certainly, you know, don't necessarily, I feel like those are very big shoes to fill. Um, and, you know, particularly my dad, who is truly a natural leader. My mother, you know, has done everything out of passion and, you know, she's made herself do things that didn't necessarily come naturally to her because of how deeply she feels about the community. She never felt like, she, my father was a natural speaker, my mother never was. You know, it's funny when I get up and speak Sometimes I feel like my mother comes out, and sometimes I feel like my father does, and I never know. Funny. I, when I get up to the podium, I never know which one is going to show up. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I feel like I've been given opportunities. Um, it's sometimes uh, feels like there's expectations um, to live up to, but, you know, and that's, 
you know, that's, that's not always easy, but I think that I'm very fortunate. My parents, you know, my parents were very loved, and I think that I get the benefit of that warm feeling, and that feels really good, and it always has. So let's go to um, talking about uh, when you were asked to be campaign chair and, and um, your duties with being campaign chair. And if you like, then you can talk about that. And then we can talk about similarly um, becoming president. So we'll start with campaign chair. Okay. Um, I would have to say that I was not necessarily on that leadership trajectory when I was asked to be campaign chair. Um, it was, I'll just say that there were some circumstances that had happened within the, you know, and, and it happens, you know, when I was um, president, the person who was my campaign chair, who was going to be president after me, moved to Atlanta. You know, things happen. So I, I think there was sort of, a position that needed to be filled and I was asked and I was not necessarily looking for that position didn't think of myself as I, I had never put myself forward who was the that. president that you were campaign chair to I was campaign chair to Susie Citron okay and so. and um, I lost my train of thought That's okay. because there was so Susie Citron asked you to be campaign chair correct as it happens I think somebody else might have asked you I, I, I somebody else did ask me yeah actually. I think so um, I sort of feel like I might have asked you, you asked me yeah and I, 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 and, I, I and I actually know where we were and I can remember sitting there at Steve's Deli, and you asked me. Okay, so is that we is very, that is that is yeah, that possible? Yeah, is that yeah. ringing a bell to it you is. at all? I th but I think but, so. but I just you know, and I w oh, I remember what I was going to say, which yeah. is that um, I had never been an education vice chair. Right. I had never I had never done that in women's philanthropy, which I think is probably fairly unusual, and I think that that's probably. You want to say, you know, what has being David and Doreen's daughter, you know, you know, it probably was a, um, people felt that I could do it. The interesting thing about you was that, that I remember when you were asked and we were very happy that you accepted it and you took to it, as they say, like a duck to water. Well. And going from there, talk a little bit about how it was for you as campaign chair. Well, thank you. Um, I certainly, you know, and I had been told that being associate campaign chair, you can pick and choose and sort of not burn yourself out because as it happens, you know, the way that we have done it for years now in women's philanthropy is that it's sort of, if you count two years as campaign chair, and two years as president with a year before as associate campaign chair, it's five years, which is, a, you know, it's a time commitment. So I was told, oh, as associate campaign chair, you pick and choose. I remember who told me all of those things. It was you. Um, anyways, uh, for me personally, because I had not um, been an education vice chair, and I, I may not have been as present at a lot of the meetings beforehand, I felt that it was really important for me to go to as many things as I could as associate campaign chair. As far as being campaign chair, um, I can say that it was a great job. Um, being campaign chair, I mean, that's really, for me, where the action is, um, you know, raising the money, doing campaign, meeting with people, that, you know, finding out, you know, what are the ways to do that, that, that was a very rewarding job for me. It was particularly challenging if you look at the year that I came on, which was um, 
2008. I was associate campaign chair. Um, May 2007, I became associate campaign chair. I believe I became campaign chair in 2008. And the economy collapsed about a few months later. And it was challenging. Our agencies were suffering. It was, you know, our campaign, you know, we maintained an incredible campaign despite the losses because we have an amazing community. Um, but it was a challenge, and um, those years were not the easiest ones to be asking for money. Um, who was your exec when you were when you were campaign chair? Marion Friedman. And did she stay? Was she your campaign? Did she? I know there was a transition. There was a transition, and I have to say, Marion was wonderful. And you know, taking a position which I hadn't really been looking to do and, and hadn't been so prepared for initially. She was so supportive, so wise, and such a wonderful person to have as my first professional. Um, I just deeply appreciated having Marion. Um, then I, did she leave? When did she when did she retire and then you got a new professional? Right. Um, so Jennifer Noparstock, who had been our associate, yeah, associate director, um, became director. And a different style, but Jennifer was fantastic. So professional, um, so on top of things. You know, I I feel like I had great it, it's really truly one of the best things about working at Federation. Um, the professionals that, you know, we that work here do this from their heart and are so amazing. Honestly, the as you know, I mean they're they're the best. So did Jennifer leave and you had another professional? I can't um, remember. I know Jennifer did leave. Right. And um, Jennifer Levine came on. Jennifer Levine came on. Were you and Rachel, and Rachel and Rachel Robinson also came on as the associate, and that was um, Rachel was so young when she came on, and so my associate, my campaign chair when I was president was Barbara Horowitz, and Rachel came on as our associate, and she would not talk. She wouldn't speak in our meetings. And finally, we, we, Barbara and I didn't know what to do, and we took her out to lunch. And we said, Rachel, you just have to talk. She ended up being so fabulous. I mean, she just, you know, we, we laugh, you know, when we, and she worked here for many years, and now I think she's in Cleveland. And uh, so how were you affected by these transitions? And of course, there's also transitions in lay leadership, too. So how, how did the transitions affect you as you were first campaign chair and then president? Um, I think my first transition from Marion to Jennifer was the hardest, okay. you know, because you're just not prepared for that. That's, you know. And I was so comfortable with Marion. But once, I think once you've gone through one transition um, like that, it, it's much easier. And Jennifer made it easy. Um, you know, we sort of got used to each other, each other's styles. And, um, and you also rely on people who are around with institutional memories. And that's something that's really important because even you know coming in as a leader, I rely on a lot of people sitting around the table for you know what was done before. You know, sitting Susie around a table with you, you have a great institutional memory. There's a lot of people who you know are very helpful. So let's go on to that question. Who were your who who have been your mentors within women's department? Um, I would say you were, have definitely been a mentor Thank to me. I, 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 but I, I mean that Thank you. truly. And, You've always been very generous with that. Thank you. And um, I, 
Well, I your feel mother like I, I, well, has that's, to have been. Well, that's, well I've, I, I, I can't, I, I, could, I wouldn't be in this place without my mother. Right. And, and so, obviously, you know, the things that, you know, she's given me that I've taken, you know, consciously and unconsciously. She's been a huge mentor. Um, I think looking at the kind of women leadership that we've had in this community um, and sitting in meetings with Jane or, you know, Jane Sherman or Penny Blumenstein or Nancy Grossfeld, the first women, you know, Be Beverly now, I mean, Beverly's fantastic. I'm thinking like, right. I'm, I'm put it going in the way back machine. Mm -hmm. But um, Linda Klein, who was the first person to ask me to do anything. Right. Um, the first professional I remember working with was Sally Krugel. Wow, you do go back a long way. So, um, so what would you say? And, and Diane Klein. I mean, those, those were the sure. first. Those yeah. were the first women who I really, you know, like Diane was president when I, Linda and Diane were presidents. I think when I first started getting involved. So, what were your? What would you say are are your proudest accomplishments from your tenure? Um, you know, there are certain things that, you know, we started doing, um, stretch to help with something that was, you know, we try, we tried. Explain what that was just so we, okay. So, um, I think what we very much tried to do was to find women where they were and involve them. Because? Be because uh, they, you know, it's hard necessary, harder to get them in the door. But if you go, things were changing. Where, yeah, things definitely have been changing. Um, it's harder to get women to go to go to meetings, to you know, certainly to solicit, to become involved. So we inaugurated this one day um, exercise philanthropy um, where you would donate, where women would donate. We had classes throughout the whole community. We had classes in the building. And we did this for a few years until, you know, it sort of ran its course, right. as things sometimes do. Um, we started letter writing campaigns, which I think is, you know, still working to this day. And um, it was very important to me that we start counting donors. I think really focusing on our donor numbers, um, particularly when, during the community downturn, because we could sometimes have a harder time raising more money, but we could certainly try to raise more donors. So doing more work with the community campaign, that was all you know, things that were important to me during the time that I was. So you know what we haven't talked about? Um, is like, oh, I'm, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Because this is something that you started. Well, that's what I was going to oh, say. Um, the Mosaic, the mosaic missions. missions. And missions in general. And missions, but missions Mosaic in, missions. But, but really, um, the Mosaic missions, which is something that you started, you know, in your presidency. Right. And, um, but I went on three of the four. Tell us what the Mosaic mission so is. So the, the Mosaic mission was a woman's mission, but it was conceived as a campaign mission, so which is very different than most of the missions that Federation sends out. Um, there really generally isn't a commitment from the people that are going on the missions to come back and solicit, to give at really, you know, any particular, we were asking women to give at a much higher level than most women's missions had done in the past. So it was not just an $1,800 commitment to go on the mission, but it was an $1,800 commitment for three years. We asked women to come back and either have a parlor meeting or solicit six friends. We had pre-mission programming. And those missions were incredibly successful in, not, in filling our leadership yes. for the next, you know, I would say, ten, Eight to ten years. Yeah. I, I look at um, the women who are in leadership now. They've, I would say, to a person, you know, went on a mosaic mission. Okay, good. So there's so much to cover, but I'm going to try to get some more things in. Um, 
What roles did you take on when your, um, your presidency was over and why did you take those on? Um, so as my presidency was ending, and I think I mentioned this earlier also, um, I've been involved on the national level as, as much as I've been involved locally. And I would say that I've transitioned. I, I'm still involved locally. And I sit on the executive board, and I'm doing a lot. But um, I'm campaign chair I was like right campaign now. Chair. I'm, I, you like, know, I'm, yeah. I'm campaign chair, and have I'm in my second year as campaign chair. But um, I've, I've been involved on the National Women's Philanthropy Board for the past seven years. So that sort of coincided with like the last two years of my presidency. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, those, those relationships are very, you know, so important to me. And the things that we do on the National Women's Board, um, I've chaired national, uh, a National King David Society mission to Morocco uh, with Robbie. Um, and now I'm chairing the International Line of Judah Conference in 2019, which is, you know, Big. That's that's something also. So, so, you know, we haven't really talked about Robbie, but let's go back a little bit because I know that my involvement with my husband being involved has always been important. Do you find that that was important for you two as a couple? And how did that filter down to your children? Um, so it has been very important to both of us. And Robbie, the things that Robbie did on cabinet have been really important. The things that he did at Hillel have been very important. Um, I would have to say that, and, and he's also chaired, uh, and he's chaired the Fisher Mission. You know, I think he chaired it several years ago. he was the head ago. of the mission committee too. He was head of the mission committee. Um, I think that he's he's been utilized, maybe a little underutilized, I think, but you know, um, just saying. But uh, he's, you know, and I think he's going on a FRD cabinet for national right now also. It's been really important. This has been and your an kids, incredible how part did of they, our did lives. Did they take on, um, are they involved in philanthropy? Um, they are starting out their lives right now. So my oldest son and daughter-in-law have a four-month-old. I, my mother, so my I, my mother was a Kipnis Wilson Award winner two years ago at the Line of Judah conference. I took my daughter-in-law with me to see my mother. You know, mm -hmm. she was you know able to do it. She was um, so blown away by that conference. Um, that she's been become involved in UJA New York now. Great. Um, they have a group of people that are involved in UJA. They've, you know, that they really like. She started a philanthropic website called Give One, which I think she was inspired to do after going to the oh, Line of Judah great. conference. That's great. Um, so she's working on that. Um, my daughter-in-law Ramona in Los Angeles is doing a leadership, uh, two-year leadership training program through um, Federation of Greater Los Angeles. Um, oh, and my son just went on the Reboot Board, which is a, a organization that looks to engage um, millennials who are in, involved in creative fields. So he just went to his first board meeting. So everybody's sort of, you know, Doing something, or you know, they're they're starting. They're they're very much starting their journeys, and um, we'll see where it takes them. So, do you feel that women solicit differently than men, and how do you feel about the whole concept of a women's campaign and women's giving? Um, I think that it's really interesting because I think perhaps. A number of years ago, it might have been seen as sort of an anachronism, you know, that it's, what do we need this for? Um, and I think that it's been proven 
very strongly that women, the transfer of wealth that's happening with women, that it's so important for women to be giving themselves and to understand philanthropy themselves. Um, it's changing back a little bit more now too because I think I see a, a different generation of women who are not as willing to give in their own name, oh we give with our family, but involving women at some level in the philanthropic decision, involving women with their own philanthropy and understanding the power the, that they have as philanthropists and it probably will evolve and change. You know, it, it may, you know, as women don't want to give separately as we see that trend happening, but still involving them and making them understand the power of their giving and their philanthropy is so important. And we are like an incubator because I've always felt that women's department, women's philanthropy, um, what we do because we just do it. We don't, there's, there's no, not necessarily the same bureaucratic issues and getting something done, getting a new program going, getting that, that we're sort of the incubator and that the best ideas for a campaign have always come out of women's philanthropy and what we do. So I'm going to switch a little bit now because we, well, we have more time obviously, but you are also a member of the Jewish uh, Women's Foundation mm -hmm. and uh, would you briefly explain why you joined the Women's Foundation and um, and what do you find meaningful about that? So this is where you might want to cut my interview <laughs> because um, I joined the Jewish Women's Foundation um, because I felt like I never felt like I needed to I, I, I never felt like I needed to know where the money was going that I needed to be so hands-on with my philanthropic Jewish giving. In fact, um, I would have to say that as campaign chair, as president, in the years, you know, right around the time that the Jewish Women's Foundation was getting off the ground, I didn't see, I didn't see the partnership aspect of it so clearly. I felt that, you know, it was competing for women's philanthropic dollars. I'll be very honest. Um, I see now that women, Jewish Women's Foundation is bringing in women. Totally. That, um, see for me, you have to understand where I come from. I can talk for hours about the unrestricted annual campaign, the unrestricted, undesignated, campaign gift as being the backbone and the strength of the Jewish community. That is, you know, that's the air I breathe. That's what I think our strength is. That's what makes this community. I've never had to feel that I need to know that my dollar is going to program A. If program A is the thing that needs the money at, at any particular time, that's fabulous, but I don't need to know. I, and I don't need to direct because I know that this has been the way our community has managed to take care of everyone for all of these years. Um, I know that there are people who find incredible meaning in learning about these programs and really being able to touch and feel and direct and that this brings in women who we're not necessarily going to bring in the other way and it also maybe introduces them to the concept of federation giving. It does. It didn't have to be for me. So for me, to be honest, the foundation ended up being one more thing on my plate, so I haven't been that involved. So, so <laughs> what are the women's issues that you personally feel the most passionate about? Um, the, the women's issues that I feel the most passionate about Yes. are not necessarily Jewish women's issues. Reproductive right. health, women's reproductive health is incredibly important to me. Um, access to health care in general for women. Um, uh, wage equality, those things. Um, prenatal care, so those things and you know, issues around surrounding abuse. 
those things are important in the general community, they're important in the Jewish community, but I would say that my issues, I'm involved with women's philanthropy because I want, you know, women to see their philanthropic power. The, the choices, you know, that I make as far as, you know, my philanthropic giving, it, it's not necessarily specifically women's issues in the Jewish community. I'm definitely involved with women's issues in the general community. I'm involved with women's issues in political realm, you know, getting more women in office. Well, do you feel that Federation has uh, valued women's philanthropy? Um, I feel that Federation has valued it. Um, some presidents more so than others, but um, I think that they really see what we've done, you know, the money that we raise and the women that we engage. It's, I think that, that we, Detroit has definitely valued women's philanthropy. We kind of touched on this, but um, in your opinion, how has women's philanthropy changed um, throughout your involvement from when you first started to today? Mm -hmm. um, well, I really think, and I, and I did touch on it, I was asked to solicit and did so really unquestioningly. And I think that had certainly had something to do with where I came from, but the people that I went out and asked to work and campaign, um, it wasn't it, it wasn't like to, it is today. It's really hard. It's really much harder to find women who want to make a phone call, want to take somebody out and ask them for money. I mean, when I started in women's philanthropy, we called cards at the Lion meeting. Um, it wasn't, you know, something that people were like, oh my God, I would never go in that room. I don't want to, you know, I don't want my card called. I don't want people to know what I'm giving. We, you know, understood that telling, being able to say what you're giving is a privilege and being able to hear what other people are giving is a motivator. So that's different. So beyond the um, actual solicitation and raising of the funds, um, how would you say women today, um, how, do, how do they feel about women's our women's department, our women's, you call it whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. How do women today look at um, women and federation? Um, well, it's nice that you you're, you think that I'm a woman of today. So. <laughs> no, no, I'm just like, sitting there today. Sitting here today. How would um, you, how, um, what do you I think of the general population of women mm -hmm. that are involved in federation I think, I think or getting women involved I, I think, into I federation. I think that it's harder it's harder to get men and women involved in anything. I, I would say it's the same a little bit. Um, there's just a lot of things that are, as, as there have always been things that compete with people's times, but we're now dealing with a generation of people that, you know, I remember going out, going door to door for the 1973 war. I mean, I remember doing that. Um, I, there are the people that now that we are talking to and are trying to reach have no memory like that. They have no memory, you know, of Israel in peril. They have you know, no memory of, it, it's just very different. So mm -hmm. getting them in the door is harder. You know, um, they don't understand, you know, unrestricted giving and it's, it, 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 all of it is much more difficult. So. so what would you say your hopes would be for women's philanthropy in the future? Um, I think that women see, my, my hopes are that women continue to see women's philanthropy as a place where they can really make a difference, 
whether or not, you know, that they can be engaged, that they can find a nurturing community, and that Detroit has been this incredible, incredible Jewish community. I mean, we have been at the forefront of everything in this country. You know, when I'm, I'm working nationally so I can see it, you know, oh, you're from Detroit? I mean, that's always been a big deal, and I hope that we can continue to do that. And I think that women also understand that we're not necessarily, we're not ghettoized in women's philanthropy. There's a lot of movement back and forth between general campaign, between you know Israel and overseas, between every part of federation. But women get things done together, and I think that's never going to change. And I think that that's the strength of women's philanthropy. So before we end, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to talk about? Um, I don't think so. I think you've been very thorough. Well, I want to thank you very, very much, Marcy. It's been uh, very much my privilege to be able to talk to you, and, and this well, has been a good, good interview. And thank you for taking part in the archives. Thank you. I appreciate being asked. You were a fabulous interviewer, and thank you for asking me to, you know, start this journey anyway. So I really appreciate it, Susie. Okay.